Welcome to the Guiding Brands Podcast with your host and chief guide, Karen Vick. This is the podcast for service-based small businesses who want to get a handle on their marketing so they can attract and gain new customers. Welcome to the Guiding Brands Podcast with your host and chief guide, Karen Vick. This is the podcast for service-based small businesses who want to attract and gain new customers. And today, we have a special guest in the studio. Please help me welcome Elizabeth Anderson, founder of Counterpart Strategies. She's on a mission to build a healthier world by empowering wellness entrepreneurs and business leaders to attract their ideal customers and grow their impact and revenue. With over a decade of experience in brand strategy, identity design, and web design, Elizabeth creates cohesive brand identities that are full of substance and soul. Her clients' brands not only look great, but also help achieve their business goals. Welcome, Elizabeth, and thank you so much for agreeing to join me on the podcast in this conversation about branding. Uh, excited, Karen, to have a conversation with you. I always enjoy talking with you. So this is going to be so much fun. I'm excited Same to here. share. Same here. Same here. Thanks. And if you don't mind, can you, you know, tell us a little bit more about yourself, you know, how you got into this field and possibly something that nobody else knows about you or most people don't know? <laughs> <laughs> you might not share something that nobody else knows. <laughs> We won't, we won't go that deep yet, but yeah, sure. So I got into uh, marketing in general uh, over 10 years ago. I was working for a company and it was a software development company in Germany that was wanting to start up a new branch in the United States. So we were forming a U.S. subsidiary and they had hired me to help with this process. So I lived with uh, working with them in Germany for a year and then came to the US and during that time I wore a lot of different hats um, and this is actually where the the seed for entrepreneurship was uh, planted within me and also the love for small businesses and startups and kind of having having some empathy for what businesses are going through when they're wearing all of the different hats and everything is on you you know and recognizing that your marketing and your branding are just one small piece mm -hmm. of all of the hats and balls that you're juggling. And so um, during that time, uh, I was handling a lot of different things, as I said, including their marketing and business development. And so um, I really uh, started on a self-taught journey of digital marketing at the time. So I've also been through <laughs> trying to navigate, you know, how do you figure this out and what actually works and what doesn't work. And then I ended up working in digital marketing agencies, uh, both for local and global businesses, and uh, learned a lot through that process, obviously, um, and just kept uh, all, all the time sort of had this vision that someday I might like to start my own thing. Um, I see. I always landed on the strategy side. I think that's just naturally how my brain works. I always sort of landed in strategy and helping clients to come up with their their overall um, plan for their marketing and for their brands. And I really realized that I was doing brand strategy uh, before I even knew that that's what that was. Um, and so it just naturally, it, it came natural to me to want to ask those questions and to get to the bottom of a of a brand and a business mm -hmm. and what they're really all about. And so uh, I have just really poured myself into that. And I think when I discovered it, it was this aha moment for me that I had found my sort of career calling anyways, as far as, um, you know, this makes a lot of sense for my skill set and it brings in the creativity. I was a, in graphic design also growing up. And so. Uh, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. It sounds like we, both have a similar um, approach or we reached where we are right now um, for similar reasons and you know, mm -hmm. curiosity and wanting to help, you know, others, yeah. you know, be successful. So thank yeah. you. Awesome. Awesome. So can you tell us or share with us one thing that most people would be surprised to know about you? So, yeah, I, I speak Finnish. 
poorly wow. now to some extent. <laughs> wow. Uh, I lived in Finland for almost four years going to school there. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Finland. Now, yeah. You know, that's one of those places that I don't know that I've ever thought that I would I, can, yeah. I would consider going, you know, but wow, wow. Yeah, yeah for me, it's... I had a, I had a connection uh, there to Finland, and so yes. that's sort of why Finland. But I, uh, since the time I was a little girl, just knew that I wanted to travel the world. So travel is a, is a really deep love of mine. Uh, being outdoors and in nature is huge. So uh, I did just sort of fall in love with Finland, because if you, if you know anything about the Nordic countries, Mm -hmm. uh, it's all forests and lakes everywhere. Mm. And they're very um, respectful and loving of nature. And uh, I really resonated with a lot of that there. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. And I'm <laughs> glad that you come to this with all of those experiences, because they inform what you do, you know, yeah. and helping uh, your customers. So today, our uh, discussion will be focusing on the process of building a brand and the results businesses gain from being strategic in these efforts. And, and so I want to start off by um, reminding our, our, our listeners and viewers that in the previous episodes, the last two episodes, actually, I started this, this conversation around the idea of brand because of the misconceptions I, I see out there and experience in talking with my own customers and just seeing um, what's happening in the in the marketing landscape, especially with social media marketing, having such a big influence on the way we market and do business. And um, my last conversation with my friend, Stephen Sued, we went into this whole idea of what is a brand? You know, we broke apart Marty Neumeyer's definition of a brand. And so um, the idea of being a brand strategist, you know, um, is kind of nebulous to so many people. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that mean? You know, most of us can identify who a, um, a web designer is and to some degree what a brand identity designer is. So can you share with us what it means to be a brand strategist? Yeah, I'd love to. So, and I loved the conversation you and Steven had in your previous discussion about um, what is a brand. And I also really love the work of Marty Neumeyer and how he breaks, he so simply breaks down what a brand is. And so just to remind everybody, and if you haven't mm -hmm. listened, um, a brand is not something tangible, like we often think of logos and colors or advertising and things like that. Um, it's really something intangible and it lives in the minds of your consumers. And so it's not even in that sense, something that you own, your customers own it in their minds. So if we think about um, the thoughts, a brand being the thoughts and feelings that somebody has about you, those thoughts and feelings about you are what are going to drive their behaviors. It's going to drive whether or not they choose to work with you or not work with you. So your brand then becomes a very critical piece of your business. How do customers view us? What do they think about us? What do they feel about us? Are they going to choose us instead of uh, somebody else or another option out there. Um, and that, by the way, is the only way that we make revenue as businesses, when somebody mm -hmm. chooses to work with us, um, chooses mm -hmm. to trust us with their investment or spend their money um, for our services or products. So um, again, the brand becomes, uh, this is why I really believe your brand is your most one of your most valuable assets that you can invest in for your business. And so the brand strategy, if that's what a brand is, then the brand strategy is our plan for how we're going to try to influence that brand in the minds of our consumers. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell somebody how to think or feel about me. In fact, if I try to, they probably won't think very well of me. Right. <laughs> right. True. I can't control what somebody thinks or feels about me. I can't control how they perceive things. If anybody here is in a committed relationship of any length of time, you know that <laughs> just because you say something one way doesn't mean the other person perceives it the way you intended, exactly. right? Um, so I can't control that. 
but I can do whatever is in my power to do to influence it. So mm. our brand strategy is the process. It's the plan for how we want to how we want to be perceived in the world. Mm-hmm. How do we want people to think of us and understanding where our customers are and our consumers are coming from so that we can do our best to get the message across in a way that they do perceive it properly. Mm-hmm. So it's our, um, you know, it's our plan, our communication plan for how we want to get our brand across. Excellent. Excellent. Um, it's so true. You know, uh, as, as I s- you know, we learn from Marty Newmeyer and from our work, you know, it's, it's almost like your reputation. It's what, it's what you're building out there. You know, the things that you do, you know, and say you, 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 they need to line up, you know? So we say one thing and then we do something else and then the results can be skewed from what you think you, you wanted in the, in the first place, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's best to start out with a, a plan or a good strategy to help, you know, um, get you where you want to go. But then like we discussed in the, in the previous episode, you know, it may just go on its own and it, you know, it may take a life of its own and go in another direction. And, and, you know, um, we're not, that we're not aware of, or we never thought that we would, mm-hmm. you know, want to do. So I want to ask you, practically speaking, what goes into building a brand? You know, what should uh, a client expect? So when I start working with a client, um, when we really kick off the process, we start with getting clear on their goals for the process and making sure everybody's on the same page. Oftentimes I go over again, what is a brand? What is a brand strategy? So that we're again, all on the same page and using a lot of the same terms because Mm -hmm. um, also there's a lot of terminology and branding that can be very confusing. There's a lot of jargon, I think out there like brand mission, brand vision, brand promise, brand, purpose, you know, so, and, and the list goes on and on and it can be very confusing. So I try to define the terms and make sure everybody, at least for our purposes, that we're all using the same vocabulary and rowing in the same direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's a series of, uh, we could call them discovery calls, um, where we go through, for me, I go through a few different topics with my clients, but it's having discussions together. So we usually have like, um, it can be done in a number of different ways, but most typically it will be like an hour to an hour and a half per week where we have a call with the leader or leaders of the company and discuss the business. We get to know all about who you are, what you're about, what's driving your business, what's the what's the bigger impact you're looking to have in your business, where do you see your business down the road, uh, those kinds of conversations, and um, who do you want your audience to be, uh, all of those, who do you think your competition is, um, and those mm-hmm. types of things, what makes you different. And then we have conversations too about that audience. Um, and depending on the client and their needs and budgets, to some extent as well, we'll do uh, a level of research as well on that audience to try to really understand what I said earlier, which is where are they coming from? What Mm -hmm. are their needs and wants and desires? What questions are they asking? How can we as a brand meet them where they are um, and help them and help bring them along on that journey to where they need to be to to work with us? Um, And then we want to understand where you fit within your market so we'll have conversations about about what's going on in your market in your industry or the trends happening and also of course who the competition is and um one thing that i think gets missed oftentimes that i like to throw out is um if you're a business listening to this and you're thinking about your competition right now try to think more broadly Uh, there's often more ways to solve a problem than one way. And so maybe you offer one type of solution. And so you may just be comparing yourself against other people who offer that same type of solution, but there may be other ways too. For example, if you're a mechanic, you're not just comparing yourself to other mechanics. 
somebody could also go online and try to read a blog somewhere and mm -hmm. do it themselves or buy parts from another market. And so those are also actually your competition. Or if you're a massage therapist, you're not just competing against other massage therapists, you're competing against acupuncturists and mm -hmm. chiropractors and anybody else who's doing some sort of a stretch lab, those are popping up, you know, that's mm -hmm. doing some sort of body work. Uh, so just a little side tip to think more broadly about who your competitors are. Um, it helps us really to get a better idea of the context that our customers are in. You know, what, what are all of the options that they could choose from and why should they choose this type of option of all the options? And in that, why should they choose you? Mm -hmm. um, and really, at the end of the day, why should they choose us is the question that we're trying to answer. Why should they, who are they, choose? <laughs> what are their other choices? Mm -hmm. Us, what is it about us that's special? So um, if you can figure out how to answer that one question, it's obviously not as easy as I'm putting it out there to be. But really, um, that's what it comes down to is why should they choose us? And it, I tell you, you meant you, your <clears throat> first example here was a mechanic and my actual, my mechanic I've been working with for over 20 years. And what I've observed, um, you know, over the years is that most of his customers, most of his customers are actually females and that is unheard of, you know, um, and that's because of how he takes care of, you know, and thinks about the needs beyond, you know, just you need a, an oil change today. He will actually mm -hmm. try to uh, encourage us to, to think about our children, you know, um, the, the safety issues that come with a car, you know, and things like that. So he could use that in essence as a way to, to set himself apart, you know, Absolutely. from the competition. I want to go back a little, a step back, mm -hmm. and it actually ties into what we're, we're just talking about here. You talk about wanting to help, um, your businesses, you know, um, build brands that are full of substance and soul. These are your mm -hmm. clients, actually. Mm -hmm. You want them to, to be, um, full of substance and soul. What, what do you mean by that? Does it, is it, basically expanding on what, what we were just talking about? <clears throat> yes, uh, it does expand on what we were talking about. So um, substance and soul to me represent, I think, two of like the most important things that I see in branding today mm -hmm. or what's needed in branding today. And if you think about, um, there are so many options of every type of business out there. I used uh, mentioned massage therapy earlier. If you're a massage therapist, in 2019, there was some estimated 350,000 massage therapists just in the United States. And I'm sure that that has risen since mm -hmm. then. Um, I know in my town, there's some sort of massage place on, it feels like just about every corner. <laughs> so how on earth? Do you stand out and be different as a massage therapist or a restaurateur or mechanic or whatever it is when there's so many others that are doing what you do? And even if you know that you do things in a different way and it's special, uh, are your customers understanding what's special and unique about you? And does, does that matter to them? Mm -hmm. um, in the way that it does to you. Because oftentimes we understand the nuances of our work a lot better than our clients do or yes. customers do. And so we can say something that doesn't necessarily connect to something in here for them. So the that's kind of like the soul for me is the way that you can differentiate yourself today, especially as a small business, you have a great opportunity because you're usually your owner or founder is like you may be the only one in your business you might be a solopreneur uh, or you might have a small team and either way your influence on the business is so great who you are the culture that you create in your business is really uh, strong and so ha has a strong influence on your business and the and the way that you deliver your work so you are the unique factor i think in your mm -hmm. business um, Karen, you and I 
do some similar work, but we offer it in very different ways, I think. Or we're different people. So people get a different experience when they're working with me versus working with you, both probably good, um, mm-hmm. but different. And Definitely so that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I know it's good when they work with you. I'm pretty sure it's well, good. I, I, well, listen, we're a mutual fan club here. So <laughs> we know. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. I was a fan right away. So I think it's your unique fingerprint it's it's the soul of who you are it's the essence of what you're all about that makes a brand what it is and then that brings me to the substance because you can't put a facade out there for people today um you know i think in previous you know times brands were able to just sort of like they could just put a nice advertising campaign out there that said we're we're like this or we're like that but it didn't necessarily run through and through the dna of their company and today consumers are armed with so much information that they they know like if you're just putting a facade out there and they don't want it they don't want fake they want to see the real you they want Mm -hmm. to see the authentic you to use the buzzword that's been used so much Um, but so it's about being really genuine and vulnerable and honest about who you are and being bold enough to stand out there as who you are and say this is what makes me different and Mm -hmm. to find the people who value the same things as you do so that's kind of where I get the substance and soul from and I think those are two of the most important things in branding today to actually to stand out and have a sustainable brand I like that I really do um and I like that because I think to some degree, we all can appreciate and connect with those words. You know, um, when you first see it, it makes you stop, you know, and wonder what does she mean about, you know, by that? And, and it makes us want to know more, you know? So um, however we define that in our own individual businesses, it, it, it will, it will bring that person in, you know? Um to be curious and ask questions. And if you approach your a potential client and they are seeing that you brand yourself as, you know, the brand strategist that brings out this substance and soul in their business, I'm sure that it will resonate with them, you know, mm-hmm. and make them want to know more about how you can do that for them. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so Thank in you. terms of the process, I imagine that, this you identify or get to this this the heart of substance and soul in this process so mm-hmm. you know that's in your discovery phase it, you know it's in those asking questions and so on so then in the process once you've gathered this information you've done the research because we know that you would need to research not only your client's competition but your client itself you know, are they a new business? Um, are they, have they been established? What, what are the things that um, they've been experiencing over a certain period of time? Why did they come to you? Why did they choose to work with you at this time? Right? Mm-hmm. So once we've identified those things, what's the next step in the, in the process? You know, um, what do you do then? <clears throat> so once I have that information, we've gone through, um, I always like to picture like the Venn, a Venn diagram where we have the three circles. Who are you? Who are your customers? Who's in your, your competition and in your market? You find that spot in the middle and we're looking for those overlaps, right? So it's an overlap between my values and what my special gifts and skills are that I'm bringing uh, to the world. What are my, what is my audience? What is my customer looking for, desiring? Um, and and how are they talking about those things that they want? So we can look for the commonalities there and find that sort of um, connection point. Mm-hmm. And then with the competition, it's almost sort of the opposite. What are they doing? So how do we do it differently? So how do we do this connection in a way that's that that shows to be unique to our competition? You know, mm-hmm. um, and how we practically do that is start developing messaging for the client. So I like to start with the message um, because we need to figure out what we want to communicate before we 
figure out how to communicate it. And to me, the, the design, design uh, is a way to communicate. So what are we trying to communicate with that design? So right. I start with the message. So mm -hmm. it does look like your purpose, vision, and mission. Um, it does look like a description of your business, you know, like a longer description and a shorter description. I try mm -hmm. to make it as practical and usable as possible. So some of this text is really just intended for internal use um, to help you and your team get clear on who you are and how you talk about who you are and what you do. But then also having text that you can use as a as a springboard for your marketing and your website and those sorts of things. It can be translated or used as um, inspiration for for mm -hmm. those other texts. So we start with creating what I call a key brand message platform um, and build that out. And then from that, now we, now we really know what it is that we're talking about. And we mm -hmm. really know what it is that we're trying to communicate and who we're trying to communicate to. And the excitement starts to build. This is what I see during the process is at first it's kind of an adventure. We're going on this expedition, you know, where we don't really know what we're going to find. And now the clarity starts to come. And um, I've actually had clients uh, just like sit up a little taller when they start to read their messaging and go, oh, my God, that is what I do. That sounds amazing. <laughs> you know? That sounds so legitimate, you know, and it's like they kind of go, wow, like I really am bringing something special mm -hmm. to the world. This is really important. I feel really confident about telling people about this. And now I know how to tell so you're, them. You're in, in essence giving them a perspective that they never had before, right? You know, mm -hmm. we're helping our customers, our clients gain that perspective, you know, that mm -hmm. their audience may just be um, sensing, you know, and we ourselves may just be customers. Of the, of the client that we're working yeah. with. We could be yeah. that that ideal client as well. But mm -hmm. um, I know it's important to also know what their audience, who they feel their audience is, um, you know, um, align with that, you know, mm -hmm. um, knowing who it is that they serve and, and, yeah. and yeah. what they do for them. You know, because it's a, it's a problem. We're to, we're trying to solve it just in the in the same way that we are trying as brand strategists are attempting to solve a business problem. They're doing the same thing for their customers. They're solving a problem. Mm -hmm. So it's just talking about that problem, how they solve it, and the results. You know, and that's mm -hmm. it's all part of the, the the language that you speak of. Correct. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. So mm -hmm. helping yeah. them to, to find a way to communicate with their customers that in a way that really does connect to, right. to them and to that need that they're trying to solve. Yeah. And once once you've come up with this language, once you've identified the language, now we move into the, the, the visual phase mm -hmm. of things, right? Right. So talk a little bit about that. Um, so in the visual like? phase, uh, we're also taking some of our research that we've done. So I do look um, like competitively. We use that in the language as well, right, as I said before. So we're looking um, at what else is going on, you know, in the industry. What other colors, for example, are businesses like you using? Um, how do we make sure that you don't blend in too much? Um, so we want to make sure that you fit in your category if you're a massage therapist. Um, maybe you want to be like the goth massage therapist, but mm -hmm. oftentimes that's not what we see. Oftentimes what we're seeing is a really um, like more serene, natural colors or lots of white and calming kind of mm -hmm. feel, you know. And so but how how can we create that in a way that's a little bit unique to you? It's so. Like like liquid death that we talked yeah. about. <laughs> yes, exactly. So it can work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to be the goth uh, massage therapist, please reach out because I would love to work on a project like that. <laughs> we'll make you the liquid death of massage therapist. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that was a great discussion uh, that you and Stephen had on the last episode. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, then we get into the design. So we're picking out your colors. We're picking out your um, 
your fonts, families, and creating this visual system. We're probably designing some, some patterns or creating some graphics that you can use that help to um, also aid in that visual brand. Um, if you're needing it, we can create a logo. A uh, logo would start happening around this time as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we build all of that into a sort of style guide that explains, you know, what the what these assets are, what these visual assets are, and why we choose them and how to use them. So how to continue to use them appropriately. So it might be, for example, even just the ratio at which you should use the different colors in your palette, that we really want this to be the predominant color and these to be more accented. We'll build out the guide at that point. We'll look at their photography as well. Um, What types of, like what kind of look do they want in their photography? Again, you can have a very different aesthetic depending on the style. They could be very warm, toned and vibrant colors, or it could be more muted and um, serene. Again, maybe there's a lot of white space in your images uh, or like my backdrop here, very, very colorful and deep. And I know from just my experience, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, this comes in part from the customer's desires and, um, you know, what our audience tells us in our research, you know, Mm -hmm. but there's often this challenge, this tug of war between the client. It says, I want green. (laughs) <laughs> when green doesn't necessarily uh, translate well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just ask you, have you, how do you overcome this with your, with your client that struggles, you know, yeah. and is struggling with the idea that maybe orange would be better than green and so on, mm-hmm. you know, how do you overcome that or help? So in my process, I find that I don't run into that too much anymore. I used to, but I guess I've improved my process since then. Um, mm-hmm. And the research helps a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I will say one throughout the process, I'm continually reiterating this idea that it's not about you. It's about them. So It's not so much about what you like or what you feel or what you think you're communicating. It's what is actually being communicated on the other end. And so we're really focusing a lot more on the customers and what they like and what's going to work for them. And it's Mm -hmm. not to say that all of your customers are all going to like the same tones of a specific color, uh, for example, but... Um, it's helpful just number one, to have that mindset as you're going through the process, that it's not so much about you, it's about them because it's their perception that is going to build or sink your business. Um, so that's what we focus on. And then when we get to the actual colors, for example, uh, or the design, there's some different things that we can do one the research that we do ahead of time really helps because the colors become uh it's it's a little bit more scientific how we're choosing them than it is based on feel so for example i have a client um it's a it's a brand new business he's still getting prepared to launch but we we went through the brand strategy process with him and started to develop his colors and he's in um kind of an environmental field, environmental conservation, um, but his his work is also very technical and like engineering. And so it's a combination of these two. And if you look at the engineering companies that are in environmental space, it's all blue, it's all green, uh, and maybe there's another accent color of like an orange or a red in there. Mm -hmm. And it was so consistent. Like when we looked at the competition and the market in general, the colors were so consistent across the board. It was like looking at a wall of water bottles. You all discussed that in your last conversation, how all of the water looks the same, right? Right. All this certain shade of blue and pure and, (laughs) you know, exactly. So when we started developing his colors, it, it became about, okay, we need you to fit into this market. We need people to see you and know that you belong in this group. But how mm-hmm. do we also make you stand out from the group? 
So we want to use those blues and greens within your brand somehow, but maybe they're not the predominant color, for example. So maybe we're going to pick uh, an orange or maybe we're going to change the shade of those a little bit. So they're a little bit more vibrant or bright or something else. So when when the conversation is going like that, we're not even I'm. It's not even about what do I feel like right. or what do you feel like. It's just what makes sense in this right. market, given what we're seeing, you know. Um, and then at the end of the day, what you're, what kind of personality are you trying to, um, to communicate? So for him, he thinks a lot of times, and he's, I would agree, like a lot of engineering companies can feel very dry and like corporate-y and mm-hmm. um, structured, as you mm-hmm. might expect from an engineer. But he has a really fun personality and he likes to make things light. And so how do we draw that out in the brand and keep it? So so at this point, like we know what we're trying to communicate and we know what we're dealing with in the market. So the conversation is just completely different. And I don't run into as much of the of the, you know, pushback. What do I feel? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it certainly like they might say, I really, <laughs> I really don't like orange. Can we choose a different accent, you know, a different right. color for that purpose, you know? And so we could work with that too. Right. Right. And what I, what I'm hearing and I'm hoping that the audience will hear and understand too, is that, you know, this work is not, um, us going off in isolation and working on this by ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's it's collaborative. We are working with you, our clients, to actually um, reach this ideal state, you know, um, where, where you'd like to be with your brand. And, um, you know, I, I think when often we hear the word strategy, we think so technical and we think that it's 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 far removed from you, the customer, having input, you know, mm-hmm. but I, I can hear that. And I want our audience to actually come away with understanding that this is a it's a process where we're working with you, you know, to to achieve our goals or your goals. Yeah. Um, so that's such a good point. Yeah, that is it's a really good point, Karen. Yeah, it is a yeah. very collaborative process. It's not my brand, you know, that I'm right. creating. It's your brand. And again, if we go to the substance and soul, like it should be about, it should be about you at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, So the rest of it is really just looking for that strategic way to help communicate that, like who you are and what you're all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, you know what? It's, it's like therapy, (laughs) honestly, (laughs) because it's, it's, we often will approach this from our own perspective and not, you know, we, we have blinders on, we see, this is what we want. This is what we see. But until somebody else comes in and actually looks at things with a different perspective, we don't know what's possible. You know, we don't know what's possible. And, and I, I believe that that's, that's what we do as, as brand strategists is, is help our clients unfold, you know, this box, you know, it's Mm not, um, it doesn't have to, stay within the box it can the box lid can be open and the lid could be red (laughs) it could be a different color than you actually thought of you know Mm -hmm. and um in the end hopefully it it will will achieve that now i know that this can take some time you know this process how Mm -hmm. how on average what do you how much time are we talking about when we talk about just the strategy portion of things, not even the designing and so on, because we can almost um, quantify that. But I know that depending on the industry that you're in, the audience that you're trying to serve, and you, what you, the client, come you know to the conversation with, to the table with, it can be shorter or longer. So mm-hmm. in your experience, what has that been like? You know, especially now that you said that you're getting better at this, you know? Yeah. 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 I'm getting a little bit more efficient. So that's good. Um, It's good for me and good for the business. uh, So they're not Uh waiting as long to get these things sorted. Uh Um, So it depends on the business and what their needs are um, and kind of how, how deep in research or how many buyer personas we need to form. And um, it, it depends on some other factors. But 
generally for a smaller business, especially one that's that's just getting started or maybe this is their first time going through a brand strategy process, typically uh, we could go through that strategy within a month, so four to five weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also uh, I have businesses, I have businesses that maybe typically will go to like 12 weeks, sometimes 16. Mm -hmm. I've also had clients that have worked with for a year to go through the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I, I, I imagine that it also depends on the size of the business. If you're talking about a a huge company with mm-hmm. um, uh, departments and, you know, yeah. um, like businesses within the business. Yeah. Divisions. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it does. It depends on the, the size and the complexity of the business. And uh, it also depends on the maturity of the business, Mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. Um, Mm -hmm. It depends a little bit on how well they already know themselves. So especially with businesses that are just getting started, oftentimes there's quite a bit of evolution that happens in the beginning stages of your business while you're really finding your thing, you know, Mm -hmm. in the market or your things um, and getting those things to find. So if you're in that stage, sometimes it actually can take a little longer because it forces you to sort of look at those things and define some things that you didn't know you were ready to define yet, you know? And so the client, for example, that took me a year, that was the situation for them that they, they had a lot internally that they still needed to decide for themselves about Mm -hmm. what, what, who did they want to be? Where were they going to go and take this business and organization? Mm -hmm. So um, they ended up calling those sessions business therapy, like you said, <laughs> <laughs> because it was a time where their leadership could come together and have those conversations. And, you know, I get to play devil's advocate a lot of the time and challenge people. Um, so mm-hmm. it's something to be prepared for if you work with a strategist uh, for your brand at some point that likely I know I do. Um, I, I like to ask a lot of questions and really make you dive deeper and it gets uncomfortable (laughs) and it can be kind of frustrating sometimes to have to really pin stuff down. Um, And, you know, and I like to like poke holes and things too. I've had clients, Mm -hmm. you know, where they're very close to the work that they do and they have developed a really specific kind of language around the work that they do. And there's some deep, meaningful reasons why they use specific words instead of other words because of mm-hmm. existing um, connotations with those words. But if the audience doesn't know your language yet, it's very difficult to connect with them using this special language. And so it becomes very difficult to get them to use a more common language, even though they disagree with the use of that word. Mm-hmm. And so there's a there's some work that needs to be done in those situations sometimes to figure out what's the best approach and how do we, how do we educate and connect kind of at the same time, you know, Mm -hmm. that's a very uh, specific kind of example. Right. So, well, then this makes me think that the, we need help. We need our clients to help us in this process, you Mm -hmm. know, so, how can a business owner help you in 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 the process of developing this strategy and this ultimately this brand new brand or rebrand so i think coming first of all i think it's my job to develop trust with the client um, mm-hmm. to make them feel safe and comfortable having these conversations because it can get vulnerable especially if you are the business Mm -hmm. Um, then it's very personal um, because a very personal journey and it's less detached and and business versus me, you know? Um, So depending on the business, but it's my job, I feel like to build that trust and rapport with my stakeholders so that we're able to have open conversation. And if there's a group of people, it's my job to develop safety within that group um, or find a way that everybody gets to have a voice in that discussion. But from the client standpoint, it's really helpful to come with an open mind. Um, Like I mentioned earlier, this idea of going on a brand expedition. And I really like that term because it's um, an expedition as a journey or a voyage uh, that you go on in order to discover something 
specific of a specific nature, you know, um, but it implies that we don't know yet what we're going to discover. So you might think you know what your brand is. You might think you know uh, who your audience is, or you might think you know what they need and that you're already communicating to them, to their needs. Um, and we may find that that's true. And we may find that that's not quite true and that there's mm -hmm. some things we could do to do that better. Um, and or that we're actually miscommunicating with them, we may find. So um, so it's helpful to come with that open mind. Uh, and really, um, I think sometimes, you know, you mentioned earlier, how do we deal with when a client has a specific opinion about something and it's really like they really feel like this is what they want. Um, it can be challenging sometimes for people to let that go. Um, I think coming with the mindset that your brand is not something that you own, so you can't hold it too tightly. You know, um, there's so much that we can do to influence how the brand comes across in other people's minds. And um, yeah, so I think coming with an open mind and sort of holding this a little loosely, at least for the duration of the process while we go through this, you know, and I, and I definitely don't mean to insinuate that your opinions are not valued or important. They absolutely are and will be fully considered in the process, but um, also, like I said, kind of holding it with a loose grip, allowing yes. us to explore some other things, you know, and, and eventually we'll come around to the, to the right option, you know? Right. Right. Make that, that makes so much sense. Um, because we can't do our jobs um, without having a good rapport with, with our clients, you know, and, um, and vice versa, you know, they mm -hmm. need to, like you said, um, feel that trust, you know, um, we have mm -hmm. to be open ourselves because we're, we're being vulnerable ourselves to some degree when we sit with our, our, our clients. And, um, again, it's about, you know, bringing that perspective that others, you know, may not have even thought about, you know, it's like was never on their radar to think a certain way. Mm -hmm. So, so having said that, um, can you share examples or a example of um, a business that you have breathed, you know, substance and uh, soul into? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. what, what, what did the client come to you with? Um, you know, what, what did they look like? you know, in the beginning and, you know, where did you take them to, you know, and, and how did that result um, look like for them? What did it look like for them? Yeah. The one that's coming to mind, um, cause I sort of talked about them earlier too. This one that uh, took like about a year, I think we worked on their brand strategy. Um, mm -hmm. So they are called the neighboring movement and mm -hmm. they're a nonprofit organization that is, um, teaching the world the lost art of neighboring, like being a good neighbor. So um, they are the ones, for example, that have, they have roots in Christianity, but the organization itself is not a, a religious organization. Um, so this, this idea that, you know, if Jesus said, love your neighbor, maybe he meant that literally, like love your neighbor. And, and there are a lot of uh, benefits for our communities when this happens. Uh, for example, elderly people being able to live in their homes longer because they have community. They have mm -hmm. neighbors that will come and help put up the Christmas lights and take down the Christmas lights or fix the gutter or, you know, things like that. Uh, so, so it's a very neat organization. I get very excited about them. I was very <laughs> excited to work with them and to help them with this mission. Um, and they're based in Kansas and they came to me They'd been an, a, a bootstrapped grassroots nonprofit for the past five years at the time that they came to me. And they were really starting to see a little bit of traction happening. They were starting to see some opportunities coming their way. And they just realized that they, uh, their, their brand, their website, their whole um, image was not helping them in any way. They just didn't look very legitimate or professional. 
Um, mm-hmm. And really, if you asked any one of them what they did, you would get a different answer from mm-hmm. each one. And it was actually very unclear to me for a long time what they actually did. <laughs> I see. Um, so when we would have our initial conversations, you know, the, the first point was, if it's taking you this long to help me understand what it is that you do exactly, like that's a problem. <laughs> we need to be able to quickly and succinctly communicate what you do and what you're all about to get people to want to learn more, to, to want to have the half hour conversation with you about what you do. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so they came to me like that. They didn't have a logo. They, they had never really created a brand um, per se. I will say you always have a brand, whether you intended to or not. <laughs> we went through that discovery process and the sessions that they ended up lovingly calling business therapy for them uh, because it really was an opportunity for their founders to come together, um, four or five of them that would come together and discuss the vision. You know, they had some different programs that they were working on, but speaking of vocabulary, they didn't want to call them programs. You know, they were like unprograms. And so it was a lot to sort through and there was a lot of verbiage. And again, they had, they had a program for churches um, and a not program (laughs) for churches um, that they, they were trying to offer, but they also didn't want to be perceived as a religious organization themselves. Um, because they had a lot of other things that were in the community and being perceived as a religious organization could alienate a lot of people that they were really trying to reach. Reach. Uh, So they were trying to figure out how to do this. So by the end of our conversations and research and uh, interviews that we did with, with customers of theirs or people that had interacted with the organization, um, we were able to come up with language and this was a big project because they did have a number of different programs that they were working on and so initiatives we, initiatives exactly <laughs> <laughs> that may be what we ended up calling them i should have reviewed uh, their their brand messaging guide but uh so we ended up coming up with language for each of those so each one was very clearly defined and it was defined within the umbrella of the overall organization. Oh, okay. So we came up with a, a clear guide and each one of those had a specific target audience that they were looking after. So we identified and defined who those target audiences were and the messaging was developed in order to connect to that audience for each mm-hmm. one of those. So we really created a, a messaging map almost for them of how to communicate about the different things that they were doing and how to communicate about the organization as a whole, considering all of these different things they had going on. Very interesting. Um, mm-hmm. And it was, and then we came up with the design um, and I worked with uh, another brand designer, Stephen Frey, and he was fantastic um, in coming up with the, the logo and the designs for them. Mm-hmm. And the, and it, it was just so fun to see them start to see their brand becoming real to them, mm. you know, and that that is the fun part when you start to see the visuals because it's now you can really feel it, feel right? it. and mm-hmm. see it and touch it. So seeing what their brand could look like, um, you know, on collateral that they might take to an event that they do in the park, like uh, mm-hmm. on a tent what, what, what do you call those booth like a booth, booth. booth. yes okay. mm-hmm. <laughs> so all of that kind of collateral and seeing their logo and the fonts and the designs the patterns that that he developed for them so that we could put that on the website and on their other material they um they said something i remember one day my favorite part of the process by the way is all these little light bulb moments that my clients have along the way where they go mm-hmm. like oh yeah that's it you know that's <laughs> what we're doing that's how we say that um and then at the end when they're seeing all of this coming together it's so fun because they said something like like wow we look really um we look really professional, professional. like we look really <laughs> legit like we're gonna have to like step up our game you know to really <laughs> like live this, be this brand, you know? And uh, it was a really cool thing for them because I think when they came to me, they were, they didn't have that confidence, you know? They really didn't, they believed in what they were doing, but they didn't have the confidence to um, to go out as much and like 
get the kind of support that they were looking for. And mm -hmm. after they had their brand, they had a completely different posture altogether about the work that they do. They had a level of confidence, confidence. in the work that they did. And they knew that they could present themselves in a way that was fitting for the type of support that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and their business has grown a lot since we worked wow. together. And I don't take full credit for that at all, but uh, I know that's been a part of it in helping them to, mm -hmm. to have a clear message and um, being able to reach out to people and supporters and other interested stakeholders. So, you know, um, a neighboring movement and what you described the work that they do, so their impact has grown greatly is, yeah. is essentially essentially what this is about you know it's mm -hmm. not just about the fundraising those things are good but um the impact on their community and their neighbors has been great that's that's awesome yeah. love that story and I, I i i truly get what you mean when uh when you talk about you know their reaction and when they see when they have these light bulb moments you know because um Again, it's about perspective. It, you know, mm -hmm. when you're in the trenches doing the work every day, you see things just the way in which you see them, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, someone coming along and opening that box, you know, you know, and say, and presenting it to you with a, you know, from a different angle, um, makes, makes all the difference in the world. So it sounds yeah. like that was a fantastic project to work on. That was awesome. a fantastic project. And awesome. I'm glad you pointed out, yeah, at the end of the day, it's about that impact. And it's what, you know, gets me so excited about the clients that I work with. I've been so fortunate. Um, I think every single one of my clients has just been like good people. You know, they just, mm. they, they're they good at what they do, but what they're really interested in is making an impact on the community around them. Um, so it's how can they use their gifts and skills to really help people to feel better about themselves, to um, to have better financial security, to have better neighbors uh, and to mm -hmm. have a, a better, stronger community. So that's been the real joy of my work is being able to to help those businesses create more impact in the world. So I, I get to sort of vicariously be a part of that. Awesome. I love that. I love that. I I. I won't go into my my projects, but I have had a few of those, and uh, yeah. it, it, it's a good feeling, you know, yeah. when you can do that. And it also it, it actually reminds me of um, my days in retail. <clears throat> I loved merchandising. I loved the displays. You know, I loved mm -hmm. creating these huge displays, and then to see people actually buy. And, you know, because the way in which you present things makes such a big difference, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, whether it be in a storefront and a front end of a, a, an end cap of a, an aisle or, or your website or your logo or just that, that um, video that you put out there that talks about, you, you know, um, it, it makes a big difference, you know, just the, the perception and it. And sometimes it just needs somebody else to just come along and just say, mm -hmm. maybe you can move that thing over there, you know, or do this a little bit differently. Think about this. So that's very helpful. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for sharing that lovely story. Um, Thanks for asking. So, um, and we're kind of wrapping up here. Um, the audience, I, I try to always leave these episodes with, um, something that our audience can actually take away, something tangible that they can um, do for themselves, you know, or in having a conversation with someone like you or I, they know what to say. They know how to actually um, go about building their brand, you know, um, marketing their businesses. You know, they they understand to some degree what this process is and what to expect and what they, you know, they can articulate this. So mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you, are there <clears throat> three things that uh, you would recommend our, our audience to actually um, take away from this that they can use to either create or build their exist a, a brand, a new brand or improve on their existing brand? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
so I actually have on my website a guide for it's the I put together the five top mistakes that I see brands making. Um, and so if people are interested, I'm not trying to turn this into a promotion, but they no, can go get that. Go right guide. Ahead. Um, I think it is actually useful. And I offer tips in there for what to do about those things. But let me talk through some of those here. Okay. And one of those is um, focusing too much on the aesthetics or thinking that your brand is all about the aesthetics. And I think at this point through the last couple of episodes in this one, we, we will have hopefully have cleared that, that up. <laughs> But if not, um, your brand is not all about your aesthetics. It really is the perception, like your reputation, as we said, that lives in the minds and hearts of your consumers uh, and other stakeholders. So um, focusing too much on that is, you know, spending, especially if you're just getting started. Uh, I see a lot of people really stressing about the color choice and the font choice. And I don't want to say that that isn't important, but if you haven't done the work before that to know specifically what it is that you're trying to communicate, then choosing those does become really difficult because it's, you know, it's a lot more about like your preference or what's trendy. Um, and that's another thing, you know, a lot of people might build their brand based on what's trending right now. And um, I think we end up with a lot of, I heard somebody use this term and I thought it was so funny, a lot of blands. A lot of bland brands <laughs> that just sort of blend in to the sea of everybody else. And that's the opposite of what you want as a brand. A brand needs to stand out. A brand mm -hmm. needs to be different from the others. It's really uncomfortable as human beings to stand out. We are conditioned to fit in, mm -hmm. to belong, to not go too far outside the lines. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so, but but you have to venture into that a little bit as a brand in order to be able to stand out more. Um, right. And I think the last thing I would say is um, be willing to alienate some people. I don't think this is in my guide, but I would say be willing to alienate some people. You are not for everybody. And especially when we talk about um, your personal fingerprint on the business is a lot of what differentiates and distinguishes you from your competitors. And so you're not everybody is going to, you're not going to be everybody's cup of tea, you know, mm -hmm. and be okay with that. And be really, for me, what helped coming through that, because I've had to go through that journey myself. And what has really helped is realizing that when I say no, or I let people say no to me, I'm opening up the door for more people who really value the same things that I value, who really value the work that I do, that are willing to pay me <laughs> mm -hmm. what I ask, which is, of course, you know, uh, important as a business too, to be able to charge what you feel that you're really worth mm -hmm. um, and not always having to discount your work just to draw people in. So I think be, being willing to stand in your own substance and soul and, and try to attract those people instead of just grabbing anybody that will come by uh, and let people say no to you and be okay with that and know that that just opens the door for more of the right kind of person to come into your business. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, very good. Very good. Um, and I'm actually going to encourage the audience to, to actually go to your website to get this guide. Mm -hmm. So Having said that, can you share your website and yeah. um, where people can find you on social media, where you'd like for them to reach out to you and connect with you? Yeah. So my <clears throat> website is counterpartstrategies.com. It's all one word, counterpartstrategies.com. And uh, the best place on social media to find me is Instagram. Uh, so I actually do check those messages much more than I check Facebook messages, although you can find me there. So on Instagram, it's at counterpart period strategies uh, for Instagram. Awesome. And I'm going to share all that in the in the show notes so mm -hmm. people can actually, um, you know, reach out to you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. This this conversation has been fantastic. Um you know, I love that we went through this exercise of defining what a brand strategy and strategist is, um, the work that you do, the process, you know, um, mm -hmm. that 
that goes into making a brand, you know, or redefining a brand, because often we're getting clients who come to us saying, you know, we need, we know we need to make a shift like, you know, um, the neighboring movement, they came to you knowing that they needed to make an adjustment, you know, Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, their experience, what our clients can experience throughout this process. I love that you, you expanded on that. Because again, my goal in, in, in having these conversations about brand and branding, brand strategy, is to help um, the average person, a small business person out there that um, we attempt to have these conversations with that don't necessarily understand. You know, um, it's easy to understand what a website is, uh, you know, and what your Instagram profile is, but not you know, what makes the brand, the thing that resonates with your audience, with your customers, the things that make us buy the products that we buy, you know, um, use, you know, the, 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 the tools that we do every day, you know, the computers that we buy, you know, and so on, where we live, the decisions that we make. So thank you so much. This has been fantastic, Elizabeth. So um, mm-hmm. I'm going to, like I said, share it in the um, show notes where everybody can reach you. And um, that's all for today. And we're going to wrap up today with saying thanks again. Thank you for having me.